Hey, good morning, and welcome to episode 54 of Talking to Artists. So uh, today I'm going to be talking to Claire Desjardins, so an amazing abstract painter who is, uh, who's done some really interesting things on her journey as an artist, including licensing and partnering and clothing and stuff like that. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to talking to her about that. Uh, before that, there's a couple things. There's the, uh, the Toronto Outdoor um, show, which will start uh, very soon. Um, I think it opens on the 12th or the 2nd of July. So keep an open for the eye open for that, which is online. Riverdale Art Walk starts actually the 20, the 19th of June, and we're going to be doing a tent tour at my studio, Art Alchemy. So there will be eight artists there, socially distanced, following all the COVID protocols, but you actually get out to come out and see real art. So that will be fun. That's the weekend of the 19th, 20th of June, I think. If you're on my mailing list, then you will get uh, some notifications to that. So I'm going to jump right in and bring Claire to the interview. Oops, I'm all skewed here. Hmm. Hopefully she can join me. Hmm. Did I screw up? That's possible. Let me try again. Oh, she's invited. <laughs> Every time I think I'm going to have a, a tech-free issue, then uh, there's something that comes up. So I don't know. Anyway, um, so I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Art Alchemy, the Art Alchemy Tour. So it's actually um, in Leaside, so that was kind of uh, Laird and Eglinton on Research Road. Uh, and there will be myself and Angela Lane, who does encaustic, Karen Jeffrey, who also does encaustic and cold wax, uh, Lisa Litowitz, who is an abstract um, painter. So apparently she can't, she sent a request. So I'm, um, I'm going to, um, Claire, if you can, Cancel your request and I will see if I can invite you. We'll see if that works. So also have uh, Roz Hermant who does uh, some really interesting photography and mixed media. So I hopefully we can see people. And I'm hoping that I can get clear on. If not, I might have to invite. Well, these things happen. Oh, <laughs> hey, how are you? Hi. Okay. Finally, it worked. Sorry about that. I was, um, I have a feeling you're only supposed to send the request to join one time and you were in the middle of giving your intro when I sent it. So it no, it should, it should be fine. I've done that before. Honestly, huh? I swear, like every time I think I've got it down, I something no else idea. comes up and I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, hi everybody. Hi. <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs> yeah. And Kate, you look great. Thanks. Well, you know, I'm in my bathroom. That's got the best light, actually. Oh, so, oh wow. yeah. I'm in my studio, but I don't really have a lot um, on the go. Usually I put a painting behind me, which I did this time. Um, yeah. This is a painting in progress instead of a, a finished painting. Usually I try to put a finished painting. Well, that's always fun. Um, yeah, I, I usually do mine for my cottage studio, but the Wi-Fi is a little bit dodgy, so you're never really totally sure. I'm going to um, turn so. you, your volume up. So, sorry. Just yeah, I'm going to do the same thing. Okay, I can hear you better now. <laughs> yeah, so I was, uh, yeah, I've loved watching your videos on, uh, on nature and stuff. And I looked at your video you got online, which I just love your website video. It's so beautiful. Um, but looks like you just live in an incredible paradise. I am really fortunate. We live out in the country and um, and surrounded by nature. And every single day I see something new, something exciting. Um, I get extremely excited and inspired by what I see around me. So yesterday, the big highlight of my day was seeing a beaver. Just And I oh. posted to say, well, here's a picture of the beaver dam. And I don't think there's a beaver that's been here in some time. And seriously, right on cue, there, like as soon as I hit like post, the beaver yeah. smacks his tail, which is what they do when they're upset. I think I was probably too close to it. A little bit too close? <laughs> And he wow. smacked his tail, which I would never have noticed the beaver if he had not done that. Um, yeah. And then starts circling back and forth and back and forth. And he's surveying me and watching me. Um, he, I didn't see him go to the dam. He went to the far end of the lake. But anyways, it was really exciting yeah. to see. So uh, those are That's the things cool. that get me every day. When I see nature uh, and when I can observe it doing its thing, um, I just, oh, I feel so fun. I know. 
Yeah. Well, and as you, you probably know too, we've sort of lived, been living at the cottage since December. So, you know, normally I live in Toronto, which I love. The cottage is a family cottage, so I've been going there for 40 years. But this is the first time that we've kind of had such a long period of time because usually it's a vacation, you have people up, it's very busy. And it's been so wonderful just to watch, you know, watch the animals and watch the nature and watch the way that the land changes, um, you know, sort of over the course of the months and days. Like every day there's something different. Yeah, yeah. And then there's my garden too, which is a whole oh. other, you know, are you a gardener? <laughs> totally. I love gardening, yeah. which is my one quandary right now because I have a quite a nice garden in the, in the city with a lot of perennials, a lot of flowers. All my peonies are just about ready to bloom. And now I'm kind of building this, uh, resurrecting really the garden, garden in the country, which everything eats it. Like the deers eat it, the groundhogs eat it. So I'm trying to figure out what to do with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, we, you could get a couple of terriers. That's, that helps always, let me tell you. <laughs> First-hand experience. Um, we used to let Rosie off-leash so that she could wander the grounds, but then she would... Uh, she would she got into a lot of trouble with some of the wildlife. So we end oh. up uh, having to keep her on leash now. And, uh, you know, it's, it, anyways, we're, we're all used to it now. That's part of our, our normal is walking <laughs> Rosie on leash, which is a shame because we're in the middle of like this paradise as far, you know, if only she would be better at we could all. <laughs> She's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was funny because we had a, we had a Bichon who was, he grew up in the city. So like, and he would walk without a leash, like on the sidewalk in the city, he walks without a leash. And at the cottage, he's, was really, he's a skittish dog, right? And so it's like, if he would go like three feet into the bush, he was like super proud of himself. So I was like, yeah, we never had to worry about him running away. <laughs> I mean, scared him. <laughs> dog. Lily was like, she was my shadow. And yeah. We had to say goodbye to Lily in January, so um, oh, I was a one dog family. Yeah, it, it was very sad, but you know, it is what it is, and it's the circle of life, right? So, um, yeah, and you love them and enjoy them while you've got them, right? Yeah, so yeah, and I, I think that a lot of uh, artists, in particular, well, a lot of people now, especially with the pandemic, that everybody's gone dog crazy. So, um, yeah, there are a lot of dog owners out there. But I have to say, I have a feeling that disproportionately, a lot of artists have dogs. <laughs> like I always did. Like, I think it's just a thing. I, yeah. I don't know. Like, every artist that I know has a dog, or practically every artist that I know. So. Yeah, well, I think there is something lovely about, you know, you spend a lot of time in your studio, and it's nice to have just a little companion there. Like, I, yeah. we lost Cosmo about, almost, about two years ago now. And so, with the pandemic, I was like, okay, I think I'm finally ready to look at having maybe another dog. Um, yeah. But of course, in the but middle I'm of the pandemic, find one now because they're hard well, to come by. Exactly, and I kind of felt I wanted to go back to the same breeder because I just love the temperament of of Cosmo. He didn't bark; he wasn't a real barky dog. And so she's like, "Yeah, I might have a litter in April or like May or June of this year." So I guess yeah. we'll see. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, are you talking about twenty twenty one? Yeah, yeah. I think so. That's I, what I'm hoping. I, so. actually, I, I'm a big proponent of uh, uh, adopt, don't shop, but I couldn't adopt. I couldn't find anything to adopt. Yeah. So I started looking at breeders and all of them, almost all of them said not before 2022, their lists are really long. And um, although, you know, much to the, the dismay of, of many of my friends who work at the rescues, because they are very concerned that now that people are going back to work and everything, they're starting to abandon their pets. Um, and they're, yeah. they're seeing an increase now. So, so anybody who's out there who is um, interested in a dog, you, you should check at your local SPCA or Humane Society, because, you know, a lot of these dogs are great dogs. And uh, mm -hmm. I think I read somewhere that, um, is it nearly half? Some figure I don't I don't know I'm not a I, are there ha, a lot of them anyways are purebred so if you're looking for a purebred you might get lucky and uh, it is worth it. So, oh yeah, I agree. My little I... <laughs> public service announcement for <laughs> that's excellent. Yeah. yeah, no, my my sister's doing that. I think my sister's kind of waiting. And the only reason we even got on the list is because it's the same breeder we worked with before. So she was only yeah. taking people who had and done I that. So in the joys of, of getting a puppy, you know, like that, yeah. that there's something very <laughs> special about that. But I, I do have to speak up. Now, having had two rescues, and Rosie is a rescue also. Um, yeah, they are. They can be equally as great, you know, as far as how. Uh, family dogs too. Oh, absolutely. Anyway, yeah. 
I, I don't to, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, no, no. I, th I, th I think that's a good soapbox to go on because I've heard that too, that a lot of people, it's going to go from can't get a dog to so many. And, you know, yeah, I think I that you're right. They, they've all been well, really, really well treated and lots of attention. And then it goes from that to yeah, no attention as people go back to work. In a cage, a wire cage all of a sudden. Yeah. So, um, I just think it's worth, anybody who's looking should investigate the rescue situation it, it's worth yeah. it, you know, because they, they're out there and they're starting to, they're starting to come back in. So, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. And so is your place, uh, it looks like you're kind of surrounded by, by nothing. Like, are you kind of really out <laughs> in the wilderness off grid or? <laughs> well, not quite. We, we have electricity and we have internet. Uh, <laughs> we're running water. Uh, although we're getting <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> we get our water from a well and we're surrounded by a lake. Um, but we're on 31 acres of, of forested, mostly forested land. Um, there is a small lake in that, which is our, our house is on the lake. Um, I don't swim in it. It's not deep enough and I don't like blood suckers. So I just, I can't do <laughs> yeah, it. I'm with you I'm there. I'm, <laughs> I'm a nature girl to a point. I spray myself when it's really a heat wave or something. I, I just yeah. can't. I can't go. I can't go in where blood suckers. I just can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> that brings back such memories of we used to go camping uh, like at Algonquin and stuff. And there was this one lake, and I, I love to swim, so I was always out in the water. But my brother was always a bit more tentative, so he'd always stay by the shore. And I remember him coming out with just like covered in blood suckers. Oh! And at the time, both my parents were smokers, right? So they'd take the cigarette and just like burn them off. And I'm like, I'm never going in the water again. <laughs> I remember, I remember, yeah, I remember somebody doing that. I remember somebody's parent burning uh, blood suckers off their, their child. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's a pretty horrific experience. <laughs> it is, yeah. So our, our, our lake at our cottage is super, super deep. Yeah. Oh, is it? Actually oh, goes, that's so nice. See, that's the problem. Ours is yeah. not. That's, that's well, funny. it is, but it freaks out a lot of people because it, there's only about four or five feet that you can actually walk, and then it's like this sheer bedrock goes right down, very, very deep. So oh. for people that have grown up in the water and are comfortable with cottages, it's dark. I mean, they're okay, but for some people, they're like, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> What's down there? <laughs> yeah, the great the darkness, the, the unknown, the fear of the unknown, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think people are still kind of afraid of the dark, right? Like, I think it's a bit of that internal instinctive kind of fear so yeah and, and even you know I, I I have a fear of the dark and yet I used to be a scuba diver and I used to even go on night dives and I can remember the first time going on a night dive on a boat out into the wide open and like it was dark and all you could see you have this light on your forehead yeah. and all you can see is this beam of light and whatever's <laughs> in front of you and then all because you have this beam of light of course fish are attracted and all size fish, including great big tarpons, like 600 pound tarpon. So you're swimming oh, along and all of a sudden, like these giant teeth right in front of you. Oh, but it was kind of exciting. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I love scuba diving. I've only been a few times, but I love it and I love the water and I love snorkeling. But that's been the one thing I thought that's actually held me back from even considering doing it. It's like, I just don't know if I could do a night dive. I think I'm just too wimpy. Oh, but there's, yeah, I guess so. I, I understand that. Um, I'm all about overcoming my fears. So if I detect a fear like that, it becomes a challenge for me. I, I don't know where this came mm -hmm. from, this thinking, but it's just something that's innate in me. And, and that is one of my fears is the dark. And, and especially when you're in an ocean and you know that there are predators around lurking yeah. in the dark and they feed at night. <laughs> <laughs> See, my, see, my problem is I think <laughs> I think I grew up with too many horror movies because that's not what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of some weird alien thing or monster thing that's going to come out of the woods. And so it's just, it's totally irrational. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Hey, you have quite the imagination, which is maybe why you're a good artist. Yeah, maybe. Sometimes I think that works against me. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. So... One of the things I have to say I loved about your uh, your video too is that real connection between there's some pictures of like you take um, there's a line of it, your your flowers and your rudbeckia daisies and then kind of how it connects to your paintings and stuff. So I mean obviously nature inspires what you do that's really obvious. Oh, really? But it, is it a conscious? Is it kind of like I want to take the energy of these flowers and reproduce them, or is it more of a kind of internal instinctive 
Oh, it, representation. It's very internal instinctive because even, um, you know, as I mentioned, I used to be a scuba diver. I think a lot of that even is in, I just spat. Oops. That's okay. I didn't feel it. <laughs> even, and that's how excited I get. <laughs> um, but even when I was a scuba diver, like the, with, I would scuba dive in the Caribbean, uh, in the Virgin Islands in particular, I did a lot of scuba diving and the colors down there, they're just so electrifying. And um, I think that was the first thing that imprinted on my brain. It was the colors that I would see when I was scuba diving, um, like, a, you know, the, the, that vivid electric purple and yellow that you see on the angel fish. And, and it, it just these amazing shocks of color uh, that just really, I think they excite anybody who would see them. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times, especially up north, you don't realize that those colors actually occur naturally in, like, in nature. Um, because they are so electric and so bright. We think of them as like, you know, cadmium yellow. Well, that, that, does, that does occur up north. But uh, there are some yeah. things that I think all, almost don't seem real. Um, and it's a completely different color palette. Like I know, um, you know, I'm sure you do the same thing. Like when I'm painting for like Art San Diego or something, you do a different color palette because that's what's surrounded by them. And that's what kind of has an emotional connection, I think, to the, that color palette. Whereas I find certainly living up north now, it's you start to really see how many billions of different types of greens there are. But you don't have as much of that pop of yeah. turquoise water, azure and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But you see, I think that's always, for me, that's embedded in my everything I do. Like, I, you know, I always have that. Mind you, I am trying to work on a new uh, color palette. Uh, I don't know if you've seen many of my recent posts. I did, I more muted and quiet. With, with the bright yeah. colors, but there is, yeah, there's, um, I, I want to, I'm really trying hard to work with calm, quiet colors. <laughs> It kind of doesn't seem like, like you, though, Claire. What? It kind of doesn't seem like you. <laughs> well, in a good way. Even you know, this thing behind me, I mean, it's, yeah, you can see a little bit. It's got, like, yeah. I, I, I'm really taking my time to choose the next color because I don't want, I don't want to overpower it. And typically, I would probably pick, like, a, a pyrrole orange or something to go next just to give it that little pop, but I'm... I'm trying to rethink, and it's, it's, it's a challenge for me to reprogram my brain and, and to use colors differently than I would usually use them. Um, but I, I enjoy the challenge, and I'm doing it for myself. I'm not doing it for anybody out there, and if you like it, that's great. But um, really, I, I'm painting for myself, and I, I think that uh, I think that's the, the bottom line, right? That's the most important thing we have to do is is – because I think if you paint for an audience all the time, like I think it would just, uh, it would go flat. I, I, I totally agree. I, I think the energy is just very different when you're doing it for yourself. But yeah, like I like to do the same thing. With San Diego, that was kind of the point where it's like, okay, it's a different color palette than I usually do. And so in trying to work through that, I'm still going to have my own exploration of it. But the biggest one for me was I had a couple clients that wanted black and white and silver, which is quite different because like you I yeah, love strong color and if, if any yeah if anything else if anything it's usually like well can you pull the color back a little I'm like yeah, I'm not sure if I can <laughs> um, but it was a really interesting intellectual challenge because you know it's just the way things work and it becomes much more almost a monochromatic piece which mm -hmm. you know is kind of fun yeah 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 it's just reprogramming rewiring your 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 brain but i i have to think about it more consciously with the with the subdued colors because mm -hmm. bright colors it's very intuitive like i said i was a scuba diver i love to garden i love to all these things that are um fill my life with a lot of color and and i think uh joy and um and it may be noisy joy, I guess, the, could you say that? Um, like, I, I'm, that's what I'm used to. So yeah. you know, I was just trying something different. And well, what, that's one of the things actually the pandemic has allowed me to do is try things in a different way. Um, since I've been in the studio so much more than I usually am, because I travel so much usually, but I have done yeah. none of that. Um, it's allowed me time to explore and also work on like mini projects of like, I'll do groupings of paintings. Um, 
and you know because one works off the other which works off the next one which gives me ideas for the next one um so i like to work in a group of maybe a, you know a few paintings i, I don't want to say mm -hmm. it, like two or five because sometimes it's five and sometimes it's two um there's no like it's pretty much as much table space as i have <laughs> table and and, and uh, easel space like whatever yeah. That space is that determines the number of works that I'm, uh, I'll, I'll work on at one time. Um, yeah, and so it just pandemic has allowed me to explore and, and as I said, create groupings uh, that I probably wouldn't have had the time to do. I used to travel to shows a lot and um, I was booked out, you know, a couple years in advance every month. And I think I went on, um, in 2019 and 2000, like from 2017 to 2000 and like even the beginning of 2020, gosh, I, I was averaging, I would, if I have to guess, it's about 10 trips a year. That's a lot when you, when something yeah. requires being on an airplane and, um, you know, so I would go to these, I would do the show and which is also a lot of work, as you know, because I know you from the artist project, I think, right? Is that what we meant? Yeah. I think we actually, the first time we met was Art Expo, New York. Yes, that's right. You did Years that. ago. Yeah. So yeah. you know the, how much work one of those shows is because you have to yeah. get all your stuff there, however you get it there, whether you hire somebody or not. And then everybody, all the artists set up at the same time. You have the same space, usually a day or two or three maybe if you're lucky three to get your booth set up yeah and you have to cart all your stuff through the show past everybody else's booth and their stuff is everywhere and your stuff is everywhere <laughs> and it's a lot of work um so you know at those those fairs you really hope that you're going to sell stuff because you got to make it worth your while right and so yeah. you do better than others um yeah so i was doing a lot of those i had uh you know i was launching i launched my apparel I have a Claire Desjardins signature collection of women's apparel. Um, so I was traveling for that as well to multiple shows, apparel shows. And, and I was doing meet and greets too over, like I, I would go like one trip, one trip in particular stands out in my mind because I had gone to several cities on the East Coast and a lot of it was driving by myself. Um, and uh, it took me to Philadelphia, Boston, New York, Chicago, and then in Chicago with a full van, I parked my van in the airport parking. And then I got on an airplane to go to, where did I go? I went to San Diego, no, Los Angeles. And oh, then, wow. <laughs> I thought crazy. I was crazy. <laughs> what? I thought I was crazy. <laughs> oh, this was like the craziest trip ever. I did like a meet and greet there at a casino. And then I, I did have a couple down uh, down days at uh, my BFF half, happens to live just south of, of there. So I went to get some R&R &R at her house, but not too much R&R because I actually, while I was there, I painted um, at, like and brought artwork with me, small pieces back on the plane to Chicago so that I could be ready for the Chicago show. And then I drove to Toronto and then Montreal <laughs> and back up to Gore here, which wow. I don't know. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a lot. And it's funny, though, because did you find, because um, I, I also do a lot of those shows, and I do find I really love, I love doing them, and I love the energy, and I love the people all around you. But at, at the end of it, you're kind of a bit burnt out. So it's not like I don't have the ability to kind of go from there to right to the studio and paint. Like, I need a bit of downtime. So you get to a point where you're just not really having enough time in the studio. That, and the pandemic yeah. certainly cured that <laughs> a lot yeah. more time. Yeah, it sure did. Um, yeah, I was actually getting ready to, uh, I was starting to feel a bit burnt out because I had to paint when I was back. I, if I was back for one week, I had to paint for one week. Um, yeah. You know, it was, it was mandatory painting time. And it was so, my time was so structured and there really wasn't any breathing relaxed time it, it's like I, I was getting pretty stressed out so anybody mm -hmm. who was rude to at all during those those few years <laughs> please forgive me and understand <laughs> I was up to here <laughs> yeah oh, well I, it's, it's hard I think it's hard and I think you're right that it's kind of um, I suspect that you're you and I are quite similar this way where there's always this drive to do the next thing and to explore the next challenge and yeah. sometimes you don't take enough time to sit and think about okay I appreciate it's a challenge it might be fun to conquer but is that really the best kind of for me 
kind of mentally right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so I, it's given me time to rethink all of that. And, you know, I, I'm now thinking that I would like to get out there and do some shows, but I'm going to maybe be a little more selective. I'm not going to do everything mm -hmm. that comes my way. Uh, yeah. I think I'm going to choose to do shows in cities that I want to go and visit as a tourist. Yeah. <laughs> That's what my plan is going to be. hundred percent. I agree. So, yeah. or, or, you know, like go to the city and get an Airbnb for a month or something for a month and paint there oh. and then do the show. Why not? That would be amazing. Yeah. Like that, that would, I would love to do. So, yeah. So you touched on your clothing line. So talk to me about um, how anthrop your uh, relationship with anthropology worked and if that's kind of what drove you finally to do your clothing line because the pieces are just beautiful. Yeah. Um, well, the, the relationship with anthropology started quite a while ago. It started about 10 years ago. And um, in those days, I was, um, I had just left my job. I had actually gotten laid off of a corporate job. I was working in an office as a graphic designer for a uh, communications, marketing communications firm. And um, I had been laid off and uh, I got this email from anthropology. They were interested in my work and I'm like, I wasn't sure like whether to believe it or not. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, I had been showing my artwork on the side. I didn't, I had had the exhibitions, but everything was on the side. My job was my main focus in my life, my corporate job. But then I lost my job. So I'm really glad that I had uh, some, you know, something on the side because I would have been, I think I would have felt very empty if I didn't. Um, so yeah, that's when it started. They, uh, they came, uh, they were opening a store in Montreal and that's where I lived at the time, was in the city, was in Montreal. And uh, they wanted to know if I would like to participate in that, uh, in that opening. And I said, well, okay. So um, I'm so glad that I did because it's bloomed into this great relationship that has lasted all these years. Uh, you know, 10 years later, I think that's unheard of for, for mm -hmm. this kind of a relationship. Um, anyways, I, what I do is I license out my work to them. Um, I cannot provide them. I'm going to just add a little quote here thing here because I will get asked for email addresses and I can't give you email addresses people so, uh, <laughs> that's just not it's, it's not good protocol um, no <laughs> but anybody who's interested should just go look it up themselves because I'll just say that the information is out there you just have to get busy on the computer um, well it sounds but it sounds to me like one of the biggest hurdles really is to believe that you can do that and actually if somebody approaches you with that don't automatically assume it's going to be a scam right like so obviously you explored it and you looked at it and you realized it was a legitimate uh, yeah. opportunity well to be very honest the very first instinct was that it was a scam and I almost deleted the email. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> glad I didn't. Um, I still have the email. Uh, I still, That's cool. Yeah, because it, it was a changing point in my life in many ways. Um, so, and, you know, I, I got connected with them and we did, and they ended up sending uh, some buyers to my house because at the time my studio was in my house. It was in an apartment in Montreal and I didn't have a real studio studio where I would go to. It was a bedroom in the apartment. So for me to store my artworks, I had them stored on the walls. So literally it was wall to wall, floor to ceiling <laughs> artwork because I had that much stuff and I had nowhere else to put it. So uh, it felt really small because, my life, because it was just so much art. It was a bit overpowered. <laughs> but they had never seen anything like it, I think. So when they came, they were like, wow. They, they were really wowed by it. You know you, you know, you get used to your own stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was used to my own space. And uh, that was, you know, so they came in and they, like, kind of made me realize that the way I lived was not like the way most people lived. So, <laughs> uh, so they, they took pictures. They said, do you mind if we take pictures? And then they did. And they took pictures of absolutely everything. Like my, my little uh, prehistoric shark tooth collection. And like, I have like all these trinkets all everywhere throughout my apartment. It was, uh, it was a bit of a museum in many ways, like all the places I'd traveled to and, um, so I can see that it was right up their alley. You know, I wasn't that familiar with the brand at the time, but I realized afterwards that it was like, it was exactly, I was exactly the, the persona that they were 
that they were doing at the time, right? Because they, that's what yeah, they were Yeah, absolutely. And um, so it worked out really well for me because they ended up buying a lot of my artwork uh, that year. They, they ended up uh, sending uh, their executive team to my apartment, uh, which was uh, really an honor. Daunting. At this point, I'm, I'm quite aware of who anthropology is now. So I'm yeah. feeling like, wow, I'm really something special here. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, so they came and they looked around and they picked out artworks. I think they left with about 23 pieces of artwork that day. It was, it was a good day. And I, I guess sitting, so. Sitting on the sofa, I'm sitting on my sofa in my living room. I, I actually, most of the time that they were there, I was pinned up against the wall, just trying not to get in their way because they were. They asked if they could take artworks off the walls, and I said, "Sure, go for it." And it just became this hive of activity. <laughs> and then after that, uh, yeah, I'm sitting on the sofa with Aaron Hoey next to me, and he goes, "This is a good day, isn't it?" And I said, "Yes, it sure is." <laughs> So it's it's interesting that they um, they bought the actual original pieces of art versus just licensing the images of it. Well, those were the early days when they would do that. Um, they yeah. they don't buy the original art anymore. Um, their their model has changed somewhat over the years. I've also done uh, with them. I've done some uh, uh, commission pieces for their corporate offices. Uh, I've uh, gone to Miami and. Uh, you know, they, they, in 2000, December, 2019, just before the pandemic hit, um, or was known anyways, um, they brought me to Miami, to Miami Art Basel and set up a, a at, at Scope office, or something, right? Myself and three other artists. Yeah. And it was wonder, it was amazing. It was a lot of work. We were exhausted. And there were even times where we were like henpecking each other. But you know what? I think now we, like, even even before we left there, we were all very um, in tune with each other. I mean, we had gone through a, a very immersive experience of uh, painting pretty much night and day and then eating together and then, like, we did everything together, right? And, you bond you quickly. You'd go your yeah. room and you'd just collapse and you'd wake up early <laughs> to get started the next day on doing the same thing. And it was so much fun. It was so, like they would bring in, what happened is anthropology would bring in whatever it is they wanted, plates or, or sofas or furniture, like whatever furniture, and we would paint them. And in fact, there is Florence Balducci, who is waving. She was one of the artists. Uh, oh, cool. <laughs> I, it was amazing, she said, yes. Um, so yeah, and it was, and. So we, we just painted a night and day, and then at the end of that, we, um, we, we were, all, all, everything that we had painted was brought to this pop-up gallery in the design district, and then they sold pieces off and everything went to charity. So, so oh, it was a wow. win-win situation. Yeah, yeah, and we were so... That sounds like such a really cool experience. Oh, it really was. And then, you know, uh, you know the pandemic hit, unfortunately, after that. Um, and, you know, so everything was shut down. And I think that what happened for me in, in some ways, I actually, because I, I was, my brand was one of the last ones that they had um, promoted. And we, were, we launched a bunch of stuff in products on anthropology in the early part of like in January, February. And I did a workshop in February in, on, uh, in California um so i think that mine was the last thing that they did before the pandemic hit so in the, mm -hmm. in some ways it served me well because i think that you know being the fashion industry um whether it's home or or actually apparel um the retail industry couldn't be quite fickle and usually you know maybe they would have promoted me for a couple months and then they would be on to the next thing but because they didn't you know, because of the to replace. I think yeah. that made my stuff ride the, the, the length of the pandemic a lot, or a lot of it anyways. Um, you know, so they, they did a lot of, we did some videos after that, um, uh, that, you know, they did a, an artist, oh God, I forget what they called it, the, the artist studio series or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, That's amazing. 
so yeah, and I did some things for them in return. Like I did little videos, like I, they sent me samples and I'm like, oh, opening my candles. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw those, those are cool. <laughs> the lampshade on the head. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like, I liked your candles. And I like the, um, and then you did Birkenstocks as well, I've seen. Is that part of your apparel line or is that, was that also a licensing? That's a kind of thing. So that's something I'm doing with Michael Gray, uh, the Michael Gray Sandal Factory. And uh, yeah, I have uh, three new designs that are for spring, summer 2021. So like right now, we just launched them. Uh, there's links on my website. Uh, it's under the wearable art section. Um, and uh yeah, so I have great, right, at the moment, I have six designs of Birkenstocks, all ready for the nice, warm, sunny season. Woo -woo. And in fact, <laughs> ta-da, I'm wearing a pair right now, so. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. I like the ones with the pink flowers. I think there's one that has, like, more pinks and yellows, and yeah, I love those ones. Well, it depends, you know, like, which, like, mm, let me show you. These, these are my feet right now. So, right. basically, what he does is he gets a cowhide printed with a, uh, whatever design it is right and um and so and then you try to cut the, like it's like making cookies right with cookie cutters right oh but different so you're not gonna get the same thing to, each so time not all identical oh cool he get, but he tries he has an, a really good eye and he won't like cut something that the design is going to be cut off or anything like that um he does a really nice job i've just ordered another uh, pair of burks for myself and then I ordered some for my marketing communications manager and some for my dad and someone else who it's a surprise, so I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> but you almost did, person, right? <laughs> that nameless person will come. <laughs> oh, dear. So, and so the wearable, the wearables is again, like you've got, I, I've seen sort of like some really cool um, like little dresses and like the dress i'm wearing a yes dress. i'm wearing an undershirt today because it's rainy and wet and cold here but uh i don't know if you can see yeah um i just took it off the hanger so it still has hanger shoulders um <laughs> and, I, and i was like oh my god i just got out of the shower i gotta get on with kate so uh this it is what it is but um yeah this is from the wearable art store and uh we have a website um so it's anybody who's interested I think that the I think that this season stuff is all sold out on the website now but there's um there's a bunch of um the fall winter stuff is actually on the website already so you can order that it includes outerwear puffer jackets and whatnot oh fun yeah. although I have to say I have a hard time getting wrapping my head around puffer jackets right now I know, I know. it seems so far away but you know it happens yeah. really quickly and um yeah, I have puffer jackets and puffer vests, and um, well, I just have the whole range of everything. So uh, I don't even know how many pieces we have this season and next season. Like uh, we went, we grew exponentially. Uh, um, we started. The idea was that we were going to have, I think, twenty pieces. Like we were going to try twenty different bodies. Okay, which is still a good investment for a start. Yeah. Um, and then rapidly it went up to about 90 pieces. So we really do have a lot, uh, a lot yeah. of different bodies. And uh, yeah, we're selling in boutiques across Canada and the US and we're at about 500 of them. And, uh, and in just before I took my California trip in uh, January, 2020, I went to London and Ooh. England for the Pure Show, which is a, an apparel show there. And so we launched the line of apparel there. I went with Brian Azaf, who's the, the, the big guy at LD International. And he, um, uh, he and I sold the clothes with, well, we have a partner there. So, uh, you know, together we all mm -hmm. were at the booth. And the trade shows there are so different than here, though, I have to say. We're used to we're used to like the hard sell, like you talk to people and blah blah. You're like it's it's you're really on, but in in Europe, um, and we were told this that we had to be like a little more subdued in our our approach. And um, I am just a talky girl, I guess. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I find myself having to just. <laughs> Yeah, that's hard. That's hard when you're normally not like that. <laughs> no, I'm not. And so, and all of, and so all of that's done through wearables then. Pardon? Is it? 
all of those sales and the, all, all the boutiques that are kind of uh, populated with your inventory is all done through wearables? The clothing, the women's clothing. The signature women's clothing. clothing. Yeah. yeah, the signature That's... collection of women's clothing. So the label in the back yeah. says Claire Desjardins. It's actually my signature. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm seeing a message here from Wearable Arts Store. We have sold oh, cool. out of our summer spring collection. Very popular. New fall winter stuff is coming in our, on our website. <laughs> So wow. Well, some congratulations. Already this morning, I checked just to see. I thought, oh, maybe I should wear something that's available. <laughs> and there's nothing available. You can't. <laughs> so I just oh, that's amazing. So I wore you, know what I, you know what I think about, I just really love about you and really admire about you as well is that so many artists are afraid to commercialize their work and cheapen the brand. And, and I think you've done such a phenomenal job of kind of you know, one can only paint so much. So how do you kind of expand your brand, expand what you're doing in a way that's really super authentic and sounds like it's a lot of fun as well. It is a lot of fun I, because I love the travel. I love interaction with the people. Um, I also like the quiet time too. Like I, I really need that quiet time. The painting is a bit, uh, that's like therapy for me. That's the downtime and I can process my thoughts and listen to a, or listen to an audio book, whatever. It's the time where I don't have to think so hard. I don't have to work as uh, to me, painting isn't work. It is work, but it's, mm. It's a different work, you though. Love, what it is it they say when you love what you do, it's never work. You'll never work a day <laughs> in your life. Well, yeah. I do work a lot of days in my life, but I also love what I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a, you know, I, I feel like there's also, um, for the longest time, I do know what you're talking about. People talk about cheapening your brand because you're you're an artist. You're supposed to be pure to your art and um, not sell out. But the thing is, I don't feel like I'm selling out in any way because, as I mentioned earlier in our talk, I'm not painting for my audience. I'm painting for myself. I paint stuff that I like that I go, oh, I really love that. Oh, I got to put some purple here or something. And it works out that because I've got this agreement with the, the apparel uh, company that they will, you know, they'll choose artworks that I've already done. I'm not painting for the apparel. Right. Uh, you know, that's just not going to work in my books. That doesn't work. So no. And I think you're, you're, and, and, well, and you're lucky on every piece. So it has to be who I am. Sorry. I had to just, yeah, no, no, no. I, I totally get you. And plus I think also, I mean, your work just is very approachable and it's very happy and you can, you know, if maybe you were creating something that was different, it may not have had such a good um, kind of connection to clothing and pillows and plates and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I mean, I personally think it's great. I'm an entrepreneur at heart. And I think that, you know, if it's not if like you're forcing yourself into a box, that you're not comfortable. in. I think it's a new challenge to approach exactly. to still stay authentic with who you are. But it's just interesting to me that there seems to be, you know, the artist community seems to be so down on actually talking about making money from your art. And I'm like, well, let's all make money from our art so we can afford our mortgage and we can afford to travel to London yeah. and live there for a year. <laughs> yeah, well, I think a lot of the, uh, the business model for uh, artists was that, you know, there's this starving artist um, uh, persona. Stereotype, and, yeah. And stereotype. And, um, you know, we've, over the years, it, the artists were basically owned by their people who would, um, they're, they're patrons, right? Like they would be given, even Leonardo da Vinci, you know, he, mm -hmm. he was not a rich guy. He's very famous, but he was never rich. And, um, but throughout the years, throughout the ages, like artists have, all, have been, um, only been able to make money at the beck and call of other people, whether those other people are gallery directors or, um, or, or like, even, you know, I, I don't, even like, it's really hard to get a, a grant. I can't get a grant. I've applied to a ton of grants and I, I just can't get them. Like, and I feel like there's, uh, there is a perception that if you are commercial, that your work is not, um, is not as worthy, perhaps. Legit. And, yes. And, um, but I disagree. And in fact, I even get annoyed with people who uh, think that way. I think it's people who are trying to maintain the, the control and the power over the artist because they they have a vested interest in, um, in it because they make money 
that's how they make them. How do you think the galleries, the galleries take like half the cost of a painting, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, there are, of course, benefits to being with galleries because they have an audience that you don't have. So, you know, there's, there's definite positive. But I think, and it's not all galleries either to say, it. I've got some great galleries. I just, um, you know, if you're in a gallery, just be, just interview them as much as you, as they interview you. Um, yeah. It's like a job description, right? Because you're getting in, in, in bed together, essentially. It's a marriage. But, <laughs> yeah. But you need to be able to control your own, uh, your own destiny. And, and that, and in order to do that, that means make your own money. And um, I feel really strongly about that. Like artists should be able to make their own money and not be uh, judged. Like, why shouldn't an artist be allowed to license yeah. their work? Like, what is it? Like, I know, I know. It's so strange. Like, there's no other, there's almost no other profession where it's like, well, you're a veterinarian, you should be doing it for free for the animals, you know? Um, I'm, I'm totally with you. Like, I believe it's, much more um, important to have multiple annuity streams kind of coming in from selling directly to doing the fairs to through galleries to, you know, prints yep. if you're doing that. And, um, and I, I agree. You never know what's going to happen down the road, right? Like it, yeah. I had an amazing gallery in Naples and then pan pandemic hit and it kind of killed the gallery. So I think we were in the it, same Naples gallery too. I think we were. I think yeah. we were. <laughs> Actually, I see a lot, I see a lot of times our, our work is kind of in the I, same place, I guess because yeah, of the bright I colors. I think yeah, so. so it's yeah. kind of fun. Because I had the same experience, and um, yeah, it's unfortunate. I was very sad to to see uh, some yeah. galleries that had to close. I did lose several galleries um, over the when the pandemic hit. Uh, it yeah. being such a, an industry that that people, you know, typically traditionally go into the space indoors to look at art, right? In a gallery, that's the whole thing. Yeah, that, that's. That's and of course, no one's going to say that's an essential service, right? Yeah, no, I, I agree. No, but I think as wrong. much yeah. as much as it's unfortunate to lose the galleries, I think it's also really important to know that you have other re sources of revenue coming in, right? So that you're kind of protected. Yeah, recurring revenue that I, you know, when I get old and disabled and my arthritis gets too bad, then I, you know, <laughs> I can't paint as easily. Um, then, uh, you know, yeah, it'd be nice to know that I have something that's going to be able to come in my in you know fill my pockets for sure mm -hmm. yeah so so what's next for you what is next uh you know what i'm in the process of trying to think of like what is next that's my that thinking of what's next is what's next uh, <laughs> i have uh, i'm working with uh, project watches uh they're uh, i'm designing some uh wrist watches uh and well i've, I've already done the the the, the the Birkenstocks, but I've got, I, I'm, right now I'm looking at some other opportunities, possibly licensing things. Um, I am considering perhaps maybe, you know, maybe signing up to a fair or two, but maybe not much more than that. Um, mm -hmm. We'll see. Um, I don't have a lot. It's the first time that I've kind of looked at my calendar and gone like, uh, like what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and I, I feel like I need to fill it up with something because I, I feel like that's, I've always had a full calendar. So, um, well, it's also good energy. Like I always find the one thing I'm really missing, I'm sure you probably are too, is that, is that, that people connection, right? Talking yeah. to people about your art and seeing how they respond. And, yeah. you know, I think that I'll probably, until I'm old and crotchety, not give up some of those art fairs because I just love that experience. I would just hire people to do all the schleppy work. <laughs> I guess yeah. what I do. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think I'm only going to, well, I'm going to, there's one art fair that I like because I found somebody who will actually hang my work for that show. And I, if I can get that person again, only if I can get that person, will I do that city again? Yeah. So, yeah. And I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I know. I was going to ask. I thought, no, I better not. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I think you mentioned earlier you've got like a marketing manager that works with you as well. Do you have, kind of have a team that helps support you in Very small kind of all those yeah, things? But, yeah, and it really is helpful to have people around you that that uh, can support you and do. My husband does. Uh, he's basically like my business manager. I mean, I get to make the decisions, but he'll he's very. Um, good with business he's got great business acumen he's got a very calm soul and uh he's able to uh analyze he's got more analytical um 
mind, I think, or he analyzes differently than I do. I am, I analyze at a very emotional level, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's really good to have somebody who's not like ground like, grounds you. <laughs> um, and he's he's he'll point out the obvious to me, but it's you know sometimes we get so wrapped up in something that's happening, we get emotional about it, we actually stop seeing it for what it is. And so he's very good at that. So I've got him, I've got, yes, a, a new marketing communications uh, manager. And uh, she just started and she's been very busy writing up a big plan for me. Um, and then I have a studio manager as well, who does uh, a lot of, she does my billing, packing, shipping. Uh, she scans in my images, my paintings. Um, and she does a lot of the follow-up stuff. Uh, she, for you know she writes you know if I need to write emails and stuff there's a lot of things that she that she can do so that takes that off my plate and it frees up some of my time I'm trying to work better I'm trying to work more streamlined and do the things that I really want to do so that I can focus on uh on that instead mm -hmm. of you know like all running around I don't know there's a lot of things that I, no, I think it makes sense. I mean, really, you're working smart and you're doing the things that only you can do, right? I, I'm like trying. other I'm people trying. can do the marketing. I'm <laughs> trying to just streamline and, and yeah, I am trying to work smarter. Yeah, but are you kind of a control monger? Did you, did you find a, it was hard to give up control of that stuff? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah so much. It, uh, <laughs> it, it is. It, that's me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that goes with the driving, don't you, though? Like, you drive forward, and you want to control how it is because you have a vision of what you can do, and it's, yeah, it's hard to kind of let other people do things, especially when they do things differently. Well, yeah, yes and no. Um, there are some things, like, I do, and I try to invite um, other opinions, um, but, you know, it is my business, and it's my brand, and um, whether it's the apparel or the painting or the cushions or laptop cover or whatever, um, so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I want it all to be as uniform and, and consistent with me and who I am as a person. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, of course, I get to veto or yay or nay, I get to say that. And I, I'm lucky that I'm in that position, but it's, and it is a nice position to be in, to be able to direct the traffic, uh, you know, or the direction of where things are going. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just waiting for my husband to retire. <laughs> He's got another two years. <laughs> He's the same way. He's much more analytical. And sometimes, it, I mean, sometimes it's really great because he'll look at the contracts and find all the issue, potential issues when I'm like excited about a project or whatever. But, yeah. you know, you need that balance between I want to drive things forward in a way that I want and him yeah. being kind of making sure there's as little risk as possible kind of around it when I figure there's always risk. <laughs> yeah, this is true. There is always risk, but there's a risk in everything that we do in life. There is one more thing that yeah. I can think of. Just I'll just throw it in here before we go. Um, that you asked what I'm, what is in the future? I am actually working on public art a little bit more than I used to. And uh, in fact, I've got a, a mural on the Boulevard of the Arts in Sarasota, Florida. That's being oh installed. It, there were some delays because of COVID, but it, we're we're. It feels like we're constantly, it's an imminent thing. It's, it's been imminent for like, oh God, for instance, God was a boy. <laughs> but I really think that time is really going to happen. <laughs> Always the optimist. <laughs> I, I, I am an eternal optimist. So I just yeah. have to throw that in because uh, that is something that um, to keep an eye out for because I hope to do more public art projects. So that's uh, super, that's super exciting. Yeah. So t tell people uh, just quickly where, where they can find you, like what email addresses, stuff like that. Yeah. Well, the best thing is to email me from my website. And my website is easy. It's my name. It's clairedesjardins.com. And on Instagram, of course, you'll have the link from this, which is a uh, Claire underscore Desjardins underscore art. Um, but really go to my website because everything come like all the links, all the everything emails, that's all there. So again, clairedesjardins.com, one word, clairedesjardins.com. Okay. And I always like to ask my uh, final question at the end, which if money, time, everything was no issue at all, what would your big hairy ass goal be? Ah, uh, I would be traveling. Although you've accomplished a lot. I would so. be traveling the world, but in a different way than I used to travel. It would be travel and go and spend, I don't know, a couple of months in, you know, the south of France and rent an old farmhouse and paint and then go to the next place. If money were no object, 
Um, That's the point. Yeah. Tuscany would be nice too. Uh, you know, maybe there's some, uh, and, and beyond too, like there are countries well beyond the borders. I, I guess we have to these days be careful of where we travel because of uh, not just health, but also uh, political states everywhere. But there, I would love to see more of the world and have and be able to do it in such a way where it's relaxed and have studios. I love to travel with studios. So, yeah, that that would be fun. That was always the, kind of the grand plan with our my creative ventures too, was to be able to kind of do these creative adventures in Tuscany or in Paris or France or Istanbul yeah. or something, you know, write it all off, have a lot of fun. <laughs> Seems like a pretty good idea. <laughs> I've done it a couple of places. I mean, I have, uh, I went to China and had a studio there and I, I went to Mexico and I had a studio there. Uh, and in Southern California, my BFS, she lets me use her two car garage as a studio. So that's kind of nice too. So, and it's, it's oh, that's really fun. fun to do stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. take your art with you. Uh, it's, it's such a freedom. It's such a luxury to do that. So, yep. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed our chat about dogs and gardens and <laughs> risk and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's been fun. Well, thank so you. Hope... I really appreciate your time and thank you for asking me to join you. This has been great. Oh, I'm delighted you could. And yeah, hopefully we'll see you at some art fair in the future. Yeah, I hope so. That'd be fun. Okay. <laughs> okay. Bye. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. And uh, just to let people know what's coming up, we have, that was wonderful. I loved uh, chatting with her. So you'll be able to find this on my Instagram. I'll post it to Facebook and on my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Kate Taylor Art to subscribe if you want to hear what other things are going on. And I am working on putting these on my podcast, but it's just taking a while because uh, I have to modify the sound. So coming up next is Karen Taylor. So she's a BC artist and she does these really wonderful fat yoga bears. Uh, they're like little sculptures. They look like bronze, but they're actually not. They're a really interesting proprietary uh, system she has for using, doing those. And then uh, Kat Tesla, again, a credible abstract painter. Uh, she just worked on a collaboration with another artist. So I'm really interested to hear how she was able to, uh, to do that, which will be really fun. And then we've got Remark Consulting, and Joanne is doing two sessions, actually. One is kind of designed for artists um, with sort of mentoring ideas to try to build your art business. And the other one is actually for collectors in terms of how collectors can start to build their art collections. So hopefully you can join me for those every Thursday, 11 o'clock. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you next week.